work day, but uh, my name is Debbie McDonald, and I am a market sector higher ed, New England higher ed market sector leader for Jacobs and also co chair of this uh, BSA SCUP College and University Roundtable together with my colleague Donna Denio, who's, who's here with us today. And we want to welcome you uh, to this panel. We have so much fun putting together these ideas and basically what we want to do, and, and many of you are familiar faces and you've heard this before, we want to make us all smarter practitioners. And whether we're institutional folks, architects, um, consultants, we really want to engage in topics and ideas, expand our knowledge, and then our influence in how we can uh, better further higher education. And so uh, this particular uh, session, I had reached out to uh, folks at uh, 180 Design and asked them if they would help facilitate a conversation. This one is called the new educational ecosystem accelerated institutional transformation. We'll get more about that. Uh, Sam Chaltain, who's a partner at 180 Design, uh, and then President Montella from Grand Valley State University, President Papazian from San Jose State University will be our panelists today and share some of their thoughts and insights into uh, this topic that I think we'll all find um, will be helpful in us understanding what the future might hold. Uh, we're not designing uh, or facilitating the present. We're really trying to understand what that future holds. So I will leave it to Sam to open the discussion and um, off we go. Thanks, Debbie. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for making the time to be here. My guess is if you're here, it was primarily because you're aware of the reputations that precede our two guests, uh, President Mantella and President Papazian, and or because you saw the word ecosystem in the title and you're particularly interested in exploring more directly what that actually means when it comes to integrated design and or you saw the words accelerating and transformation and thought that is exactly what you're interested in. But whatever your reason for coming, we have the opportunity together, as Debbie said, to become smarter practitioners together. We're a mixture of educators and designers and leaders. And all of us um, happen to be human beings alive at the moment in Homo sapiens development when talk of transformation and a new learning ecosystem becomes not only more relevant, but more urgently viable than ever. So this time is a chance for us to think together about the implications of that and some of the paths forward. Uh, just one note by way of process, and then we'll get into it, which is, if you haven't already, I'd like to urge you to open up the chat bar and to use it actively. One of the things that I think is a really nice gift of Zoom in the COVID era, now that we've all become so fluent in it, is it does give us an opportunity to have two experiences simultaneously. There is the synchronous conversation, in which case, generally only one of us can be speaking. And then there is the Zoom chat in which all of us can be sharing observations of interesting notes that we've heard, asking questions that I will take responsibility of trying to integrate into the conversation, and basically doing in a shared visible form what each of us is probably doing in our own analog form. I'd like to be active in the chat with your observations, your epiphanies, and your questions. Um, so let's begin. And I want to begin, as I said, the way that we're going to, I think, ultimately work our way up to a more present and future oriented conversation about learning ecosystems is by better understanding the paths that are allowing us to get there from here. And I want to begin with the, the most personal paths, the paths of our 
of our guests. So first, and I'm going to ask each of you to kind of offer your own answer to this question popcorn style, but I just want to give everybody a little bit of context. So um, Mary Papazian, if you don't know, is the 30th president of San Jose State University. She is also a native Californian and a scholar of English Renaissance literature. She just couldn't stop getting degrees at UCLA. Um, at San Jose State, being nested right in the valley of Sil Silicon Valley, she has some really interesting perspectives, and that's part of what we're going to get to learn from her today. But first, we're going to get to just hear a little bit of the path that led Mary Papazian to become a university president. Uh, the same will go for Philomena Mantella, who is the fifth president of Grand Valley State University, and who, like Dr. Papazian, has um, several decades worth of experience in higher education before joining Grand Valley as, by the way, its first female president. She was the CEO of the uh, Lifelong Learning Lab at Northeastern University, where she was responsible for thinking through all possible ways of reaching, activating, and retaining 18,000 adult learners around the world. Um, and then at least for the first question, and then we'll see throughout, I also want to invite um, Chung Li to offer a sense of his personal path. If you don't know Li, Li is one of the world's finest architects when it comes to learning design and um, has been doing this work over the course of his career at all levels from preschool to higher education. And so knowing that there are lots of designers on the call, I thought it would also be interesting to hear Lee's perspective. So knowing that, um, popcorn style, which of the three of you would like to start by giving us a sense of your personal path that has led you to this moment? Well, I, I guess I'll jump in, Sam, since, since you named me first, even though that's out of alphabetical order. So the last will be first, as they say. Um, but, but thank you for that. And, and it's great to see everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's not often that I have the uh, opportunity to speak with a group like this. And so um, I've been really looking forward to this. Um, as a scholar of Renaissance literature, you can imagine that my colleagues and many here in Silicon Valley wondered why in the heck San Jose State was hiring a Renaissance English literature professor, when after all, it's known as the pipeline institution for Silicon Valley companies with very large engineering programs and science and all of those kinds of things. But people forget that it also has deep roots in the arts. And um, as the oldest public university in the West, uh, it really does work on all cylinders. My own path, of course, I'm a, I'm a native Southern Californian, fourth generation actually, uh, and uh, found my way to UCLA because that's where my parents uh, went to school and met. So there's something sort of in the family. But the other side of it was that it was affordable um, and I'm one of four. And so we had four kids in college at the same time. And this made it possible for, for each of us to, um, to really benefit from a wonderful education. I, I uh, always knew I would study English. It was what my mother did, and she was a teacher for many years, so I saw that. But I think more importantly is I love stories, and I loved what stories told us about people and about communities and about, you know, our society and our place in the world. And I think that's really what's driven me throughout, and it's how I think of, of um, you know, my purpose ultimately in serving in higher education. Um, when you come out with a PhD in English, you're grateful to have a job. It's not actually one where everybody gets one. We are exactly the inverse of what the market should be. Much too much oversupply and very little demand um, because of the economics of higher education. Uh, but I was fortunate to be able to, uh, to land at a wonderful institution not too far from Philly's home base um, out in southeastern Michigan called Oakland University and uh, really had a pretty traditional academic career for the first half of my, of my career. And I was a faculty member, I taught um, my courses, I loved it, I worked with my students. 
And then I was driven, uh, encouraged to uh, take an administrative role as an associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. I had come to it through accreditation, ironically, and the reason I had been pulled into that was they needed somebody to edit together the report, and they thought an English professor could do that well. Uh, so, so there I was, and I learned so much about the university and the academic and the non-academic sides that I never really had understood before how it fit together and um, and what the pieces were. And so, um, I, you know, I became an associate dean. Uh, ultimately, I became a dean of humanities and social sciences in Montclair, New Jersey. Imagine my surprise as a Southern Californian walking into Montclair State. And for those of you who know the campus, um, you can anticipate where I'm going. If you don't, go visit it sometime. I walked onto a campus where it seemed most of the buildings had California mission style. Completely out of place in Montclair, New Jersey, across the river from Manhattan. But it's all with the red tile and the, the, the whole look of the California mission. And I thought they did it just for me. So it had to be the reason why I had to go to that campus. I accepted that job and then spent some time uh, as a provost chief academic officer at Lehman College of the City University of New York. And what became really interested, interesting for me is I really moved from, if you will, a suburban institution at, at in Rochester, Michigan, north, su northern suburb of Detroit through these very urban institutions. And, and I think this is really important because it gave me a very different sense of the connection between campus, students who are coming from these communities and the communities and the cities uh, that surround us. I did that for about five years and then went to uh, my first presidency, which was in New Haven, Connecticut. Had an amazing time there um, at Southern Connecticut. I was there for close to five years and then made my way out to, um, to San Jose. And I'll just leave you with this uh, before turning it over to my colleagues. I learned then something that apparently my mother knew, but very few others did, that San Jose State is the oldest public university, started out as a teacher's college, a normal school uh, in 1857. And at a certain point, it launched some branch campuses, the first of which in the 1880s was in Los Angeles. That Los Angeles campus ultimately became UCLA in 1919. It actually became University of California Southern Branch. They're celebrating their centennial. They have forgotten the first part of their history. I, you know, humorously like to remind them of that. But somehow it's a reminder that we are all connected. We're all interdependent. We all really do uh, grow in ways that we sometimes don't always see. So that's that's my path, Sam. Thank you, Mary. So hi, everyone. It's great to be with you. I too have looked forward to this and um, Sam and Lee, I've come to know, uh, and it's actually kind of an interesting way to think about who you're going to work with on the future of education. Uh, they worked on a project together, a building project uh, around our digital learning center. And I was really inspired by um, the way in which they understood the context. So I appreciated that so much that it was just a gift to be able to share the context with you and have a conversation on how all this, these futures um, influence our work. And in many ways, it's not the future of education, it's the future of so many shifts. We think about education needing to, um, to respond to and follow and be relevant within. So um, glad to be sharing this, uh, this uh, Zoom room with Sam and Lee. And I've come to know Mary, our paths have crossed uh, in different parts of the country and um, sort of three degrees of separation, but I've got to know her on our most recent project and she's just a superstar. So Mary, thank you for also joining me today. Um, so my, my uh, background, you know, I was a, a very, I grew up in upstate New York um, my, my, my dad completed the eighth grade. My mom completed high school neither went to college. Four kids, loving family, a lot of support, um, but, and knew that we all had to go to college, uh, but really had no clue how to get us there um, and where and how and how to pay for it or any of those things. So therefore, any, any um, resources and there wasn't much that they needed to spend, they spend on the first child. And so the other three of us had to kind of figure out the way to get there um, just because, you know, they saw the bill and it had to be paid. Um, 
So I picked my college too on affordability, although it was Syracuse University, which you wouldn't think of as affordable, but, um, but their financial aid package was the most generous and um, did a lot of um, school and work and school and work all the way through my experience to be able to kind of do it on my own. So um, as I experienced, you know, my university experience, it was really about learning not only who I was, but, you know, just how to navigate the world in the, in the simplest of ways. And um, it's very much what sort of inspired me to university leadership. And uh, I ended up doing my degree in social work and a master's in social work because I knew I wanted to work with people. It was kind of that simple where I started. But then saw the more systemic view of social work um, when I was doing my master's and started to think about applying that to um, to higher education, working with students who were underserved and didn't have the resources or had had children, single parents with some of my early work and getting them to re-enter school. And um, I just, I, I loved education and the power of education. And I loved the seeing how those leaps and bounds, you know, allowing people to realize their own full potential. And I know that sounds a little bit like a view book, but it really is my, um, my own personal story. So because of both my academic degree and um, where I entered higher education, which was on grant funding, student support, higher education opportunity programs, if you kind of know any of those federal funding, I found my way to more of what is either depending on kind of in the institutional environment, either enrollment development, enrollment management or student affairs, student support on sort of that side of the house. And um, sure enough, as you're dealing with those issues and you're dealing with the financials of individual students, you're learning a lot about yourself. And I learned um, what I intuited about what I liked about social work, I loved working on complex systems and I loved the financial end of the institution. So I ended up finding my way to Michigan, um, was a kind of a, my, my first sort of Dean of Enrollment kind of job and um, finding my way here, working on a PhD because of a great mentor, the president who said, you know, stop trying to only work your way into where you wanna go, stop and get more education and um, really enabled me to do that. And so um, again, I, I think about all the people that I'm grateful for along the way that you know helped me to, to be where I am and to be able to serve. So they're really important to me to mention when I tell my story. Um, so I sort of through my PhD, I said, okay, I wanna be in education. I'm gonna do my PhD in higher education. Um, and I sort of analyzed myself and I realized I wasn't Mary, you know, I didn't have a classic academic preparation and I, I, I wasn't going for tenure and I wasn't moving up to department chair and provost and on into the most common route to a presidency in, in, at that time. And so I sort of said, I have to be um, more holistic to the way that I view who who I'm going to be, what I'm going to bring. So I did my PhD in business affairs in higher education and tried to strengthen that side. And my journey had, has always been a, one, you know, a kind of love to learn, you know, the different kinds of institutions. I've worked at community college. I've worked at the smallest graduate school in SUNY. I've worked at um, the school with the worst bond rating in the country, a private that was just almost, you know, on its last legs. I've worked at really fine institutions, but just seeing the various dimensions of education. And I spent my last 18 years before coming here at Northeastern University, which is a really interesting place. And I know there's a lot of folks that have spent time or are in Boston, so you probably know Northeastern. It embeds experiential learning in, uh, in all students' curricula uh, across the board. It's a very creative place. And I remember when the president said to me, you know, you're the most creative person that, that I have and I'd like you to run an educational accelerator. And I thought, I'm not creative. What, what is, you know, what the heck is he talking about? I've been an evidence-based, you know, on my path, on my mission sort of, um, uh, leader and uh, 
I realize that creativity comes in kind of all of your moments of asking questions and being curious and um, just respecting other people's voices. And I, when I, you know, realized that I said yes. And I had a, this just phenomenal journey of ex experimenting in, you know, um, first boot camps done uh, at a university of that, at that type, new forms of integrated work and learning, opening global campuses, digital education, and expanding the adult portfolio. And that led me here. So my, when, when I had the opportunity to come to Grand Valley, I only remembered Grand Valley from when I was working on my PhD in Michigan, which thank you, Sam, for not mentioning the number of decades ago that really was. I appreciate that. Um, but it was a long time ago. And so it, um, Grand Valley is only 60 years old. And um, it's the fastest growing institution in Michigan with Oakland, uh, where Mary had spent some time right behind it. And um, so young, energetic, many changes. And I started to look, I hadn't realized its size, its breadth of programs, its scope. And then I started to really look at the place and the people and um, really excited about the kind of um, educational model, the role the faculty played and the agility that the institution had has in terms of um, being able to kind of absorb and accept and go after change. So, you know, my sense of the future and the kinds of dramatic shifts, it's the kind of place that I felt I wanted to be at. The last thing I would say is it's, you know, it's got a great price point for all of that it offers. And I think the return on investment notion in education, affordability, um, is all very important to the future. So it drew me here and I am having a freaking ball. I am just enjoying myself immensely. And, um, you know, I, I, th I think it's sort of unfair that they pay me for this work because it's really, it's really a lot of fun. And I know president's jobs are hard and I've had my moments. Oh my God, have I had my moments, but, um, but the reality is the the ninety percent that is is phenomenal. It just carries you through every day. So with that, I'll stop. And thanks for letting me share about myself. So um, thank you. And Lee, with your permission, I'm going to weave you in uh, a little bit later because I actually something that I heard both of you say. So it's interesting that we have. So on one hand, we have the oldest public university in the Western United States. On the other hand, we have a university that's just 60 years old. On one hand, we have a person who anchors the description of her own path as saying, I love stories. On the other, we have a person who anchors her path by saying, I love complex systems. So let's swirl those observations together by way of getting into the path that higher education has followed up to this point. So I, I know that the bulk of our time is gonna be talking about how education must pursue. But I do think it's important that we ground ourselves in a shared understanding here. And in particular, Mary and Philomena, what I'm interested in hearing you respond to is from your perspective, if you think about the path that higher education has largely followed. And by this, I mean larger than San Jose State or Grand Valley. Like if you're viewing the field, um, what has been its beacon for better or for worse? Or what have been its beacons that lead us to this point and how you would describe that point? And maybe we'll, we'll flip it. So Philly, would you like to go first this time? Um, yeah, sure, happy to. So maybe let, let's um, offer some dynamics and go back and forth a little bit. So let me offer one that I think is an interesting one because I think um, irrespective of sort of, I don't, you know, let me say it this way, there has been some obviously relationship to the growth and maturity. And if you think of the, the birth of the land grant institutions or the GI Bill, you know, you think of times where education has positioned itself for particular relevance for a particular moment. 
I would offer that it stayed in those models for a very long period of time and perhaps beyond the moment. So if I use, um, you know, my, my past institution and institutions um, that um, work a great deal on sort of moving up the, the food chain in higher education where reputation is what we're seeking, social networks is what we want to be strongest and therefore we have sort of a method of pursuing our education, but those are the things we want. It's really a model of exclusion rather than inclusion. It's a model where we say we are the most selective institution in the country, so therefore we reject 95% of the applicants that are coming to us. So it's a very different model than many um, ways in which institutions gain reputation, which in some cases may be scale, maybe um, service relevance. So that I think we have these models and these ways in which we approach um, educational delivery or educational reputation building that in some cases stay too long or don't fit the moment. So if you look at a, a, an educational model that is around more exclusion than inclusion, and you look at the societal moment at where inclusive prosperity is one of our most important pieces of work, um, you see a disconnect. So um, I think we stay in some of our models too long and we could go through all those models historically, but, but that's just an observation I would make as we pivot to change. So I'm gonna to turn to Mary, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, let me let me kind of play on some of that, um, if I might, because um, even though we're the oldest in the West, we call ourselves the original startup, trying to bring that spirit of innovation um, that permeates um, Silicon Valley, of course, and is a big part of that that whole global movement toward innovation. But the reality is, it's true. I mean, we started out as a very small institution, an institute, who prepared teachers for the emerging frontier. And I do think um, if you exclude the traditional, um, uh, let's say the Ivy League types of schools, and you look at the uh, development of many of the publics across the country, not all of which uh, were land grants, many of which actually started before the land grant, the Morrill Act in 1861. But these, this was a way of expanding education, actually, um, for to people who traditionally hadn't had it, beyond just trading ministers or the, the children of the affluent and that sort of thing, really expanding it across the entire United States, which was still moving westward, still putting down roots, still growing. Now, that was not full inclusion, there's no doubt about it, but it was inclusion against what we had seen um, purely in say the traditional Ivies. I'll, I'll just use that as kind of a, a catchword to, to talk about those kinds of very early institutions. And I do think we have seen that happen over time. The development of the normal schools was another mechanism to do that. As, as Philly said, the GI Bill opened up education to people who had never had it before. Many of those who took advantage of the GI Bill were first generation students. Many of those students who come to us today are first generation students. They look different. The particulars of their stories is different, but we are seeing it. And I think that the difference is in the speed of change, which is why it feels today like we've been stuck because we're at a time when change has grown exponentially. That's just, I mean, you can go back to Moore's Law if you want, if you want to use Silicon Valley language. Gordon Moore, of course, uh, started his educational career at San Jose State, just wanted to plug that. But this, this notion of, of the speed doubling, this, you know, um, yeah, at each iteration. And, and the truth is the 19th and 20th century saw change, but it was not within five years, it was in within one or two generations. So we had time to absorb that change, let it settle, develop the patterns and the, and the procedures that we use and all of those kinds of things. Now what we're seeing is change is happening so quickly, we don't have time for that anymore. So now it feels, um, to Philly's point, like we're stuck in old models 
Those old models served us as well as probably could have been in the 20th century, but they certainly don't serve us in the 21st century with the changing demographics that we've seen, with the, the movement of, of people, the, the commitment to educating for the skills of today and tomorrow, the importance of inclusive um, voices around the table and all of those things that go into it, which I know we'll be talking about. Um, but I think what has been as much movement toward inclusivity as not. We just noticed now what was excluded, which was serious. And I should add, this was also, if you go back to the 19th to 20th centuries, the developments of the HBCUs, for example, as an avenue for Black Americans to gain their education. And so we've, we've now we see the growth of the uh, Hispanic serving institutions and Anapizi serving institutions, Asian, Pacific Islander, Native American. Etc. The tribal colleges again. So we're seeing all of these pieces. The question is, what do we do with it all now, and how do we meet the moment that this economy, that this level of change, this speed of change requires of us? I would just want to add a couple dimensions to what Mary said so beautifully. I think one is certainly technology, and that is underwriting the speed, but just the adaption and adoption as it relates to different ways people learn. Um, we haven't seen the best of it with the pandemic. You know, None of us believe that this particular environment that we're sitting in today is the best of online learning or digital learning, but, um, but just the speed of technology is absolutely key. And then, you know, I think the, the, one of the things that I think is Mary and I do our work together with other colleagues is the competitive instincts as the demographics go down can be contrary to the public good to have us work across our strengths, right? So it's kind of a, you pick your model and we know our strengths. I know what Grand Valley's strengths are. I know that we have unbelievable health professions education. We have very good applied research in key areas. We have great liberal education that undergirds um, the HBCUs knows their strength. Mary knows her strengths and in her institutions, but we tend to work in isolation. What this kind of environment calls for is a, a, a view in which we leverage one another's strength for the public good and um, to kind of get out of our space and our lanes and get our leadership from collaboration and partnerships and network that broaden and scale our impact. Yeah, that's a really important point. And Sam, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in again. I hope that's okay. Because, you know, it's always, I'm always so stimulated with ideas when, when I hear Philly, who's one of the most creative thinkers. Um, uh, President Ayun is right, uh, uh, Philly, um, in higher education. And, and I, I will say this, that the other thing that happened historically was the growth of the research institution, uh, the research university. And, and this was based on an old German model, actually. But we started to see, and so many of these institutions that became more exclusive, right, more selective, happen to also be many of those institutions that are research universities. Though you do also see it in some of the small, very, you know, uh, elite liberal arts colleges. I'll leave those alone for, for a minute. That's all well and good because it, it requires a certain amount of infrastructure to be successful at the research level, but it's no longer sufficient. And, and the reason I say that, and I think this is important as we think about how we design and plan institutions going forward, the problems we're facing today and the approach we take to asking the questions, and these are questions, yes, in learning, but they're all and, and in, in sort of the public space, but also in the kinds of ways we do research have to include all of these voices and lived experiences. So this kind of questioning no longer exists purely in the realm of the research or the traditional highly selective research institutions. Institutions like ours, like Grand Valley, like Oakland, many others are also engaged more and more in an integrated model of teaching and research that allows us to bring, if you will, an equity lens to the very problems we see in front of us. How do we address climate change? There's the very pure science that you can do in a lab, but then there's also the impact on communities and that will have a different set of questions depending on who is asking them. And so opening that space up, I think is gonna be really important going forward. 
So I'm going to suggest let's use that as a way to segue into um, talking about the future paths. And let's, I, I would imagine there's going to be multiple ways that we choose to explore the future of higher ed together. Let's stay grounded, though, in what Mary was just talking about, which is the equity lens. And I mean, just to state the obvious, like it just so happens that we are having this conversation on the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. And as there are other ways that social institutions failed George Floyd before that day. For example, as many of you probably know, George Floyd was uh, a college student. Um, what you may not know is that he is also the statistic that describes a larger systemic failure in our society, which is that the percentage of college going students of color who actually are able to complete their degree and, and, and graduate is 11%. So George Floyd, as somebody who started school and didn't finish, that's another way that we failed him. So I guess the, the question for the two of you with that as our backdrop is if we're applying the equity lens, as Mary says, and if we are um, figuring out new ways of collaborating across institutions in order to better serve the public's purpose, what is it that the two of you are most excited about in that regard that helps us get a sense of where this future of a different type of learning ecosystem may ultimately reside and what it may ultimately yield. So maybe I'll start there and um, really begin with where Mary's conversation took us, which is the pace of change. And how do we grapple with that across our institutions in the way that they're designed and structured? And if you think of the, the um, I, I remember Mary going to Silicon Valley when I was um, opening the Silicon Valley campus. And I was so proud of myself because I had met with a, a business leader who was in the cybersecurity space and brought forward a certificate to help him upskill his workforce and um, did it in nine months. And he looked at me very seriously and he said, I've turned over half of my workforce. Um, it's a very young workforce, very hot market, you know, and he's like, I'm thinking nine months, not two years to develop a program, which is the average length of time, you know, for a program to start in its research, evaluation, going through the curriculum committees and um, before it gets approved, then there's a period of time before it gets into the truly absorbed by the market. And it was almost nonsensical um, in Silicon Valley, which Mary could speak much more to. But the pace of change is really um, one of the things that we were trying to grapple with as we thought about the equity lens. We do not as a society have time or space you know, this is that one of our most urgent issues is the people we're leaving behind in our greatest vehicle for social mobility, education. And so um, as we sort of came together in the way that Mary and my work connected um, for the first time in a deep way, rather than through those degrees of separation, was around a new initiative called REP4, which is rapid educational prototyping for change equity, learner, and community. And um, the notion was the basic notion is we got to deal with the pace. So therefore we've got to work as a, a collective that's supporting each other with our strengths, our energy, sharing our experiments, et cetera. The sort of second basic premise, and I think it's going to be a premise for our future was that learners have to lead and those learners have to be those that are underserved in higher education. And so um, the way in this is formulated is really the learners, 11th and 12th grades, largely underrepresented students become designers, you know, of co-designers of um, educational solutions. And through that lens, they're also reflecting on their own experience. They're moving 
in their own thinking of how they want to take on their educational journey. They're seeing their own power and their own voice. Um, and so, uh, you know, what, what we've done is really come together to think about how do you accelerate through really looking at the best of what startups do to prototype? How do you do that with learners in the center that are those that we're leaving behind? And then how do you structure around that so the institution is hungry to work with them and talk with them? And that is at its sort of simple form, the way that I think about what we're, our initiative is. So I'll turn that to Mary to, to add more. Yeah, it's a, and it's a fantastic initiative because it, it has at its core that we learn from each other. So there's a certain humility in it um, and, and a recognition that we learn from, from our students, um, you know, from, from learners. It, this goes back to the, 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 the kind of the classic phrase that, um, um, you know, talent is everywhere. It's the opportunity that isn't. And so the question becomes, how do we as institutions, particularly those of us in the public space, really embrace our, um, our mission, you know, to educate our communities and to provide real opportunities for students? The truth is the fact that, I mean, in, in a way, the accessibility of information through the internet actually makes it possible and makes it necessary to flip this whole model on its head. Because, and I see this with my own kids, but all young people everywhere, if they want to know something, we all do it. We just, you know, we pull out Google or you pick your, your Internet Explorer and you go find your answer and then you try to figure out if it's actually true or not. Most of us believe it um, for better or worse to our civic health, but I'll leave that to another day. But, um, but the truth is information is everywhere. We cannot know everything we need to know that's out there to know. So what we have to develop, and this now goes back to my Renaissance literature training. In the Renaissance, we have a phrase that we call habits of thought. And it's ways of seeing the world. If we create habits of thought based on problem solving, recognizing a problem, being able to articulate it, working together as teams, that can start very young. It's not just older people who know how to do that. Frankly, young people are really good at it. They, they, this is what engages them and what gets them excited. And frankly, they are very creative and they have a lot of ideas and they work together and they learn together. That's what Silicon Valley does. I mean, that's how those companies develop. It's by this team-based problem solving kind of creative space where ideas are tested and then, you know, failure is not just permitted, but, but actually supported, encouraged, because it's the only way you test your limits and you try things that are very different. And when you think about underserved students or first generation students, and in San Jose State, we have a very high percentage of first gen students and we're only maybe 12% white. I mean, so we're a very diverse campus. So we have students from many multiple communities and what we find, and, and we're not all the way there yet, we have a lot to learn still, that students who feel they don't belong, and this is something you see in a lot of first-gen students, a lot of underserved students, it's that, um, you know, that sense that I'm here, but I really shouldn't be here. You know, they sort of know the numbers, if not by statistics, by people they know in their communities. And so anything that's rough can be a reminder to them that they don't belong. And so from a strategy point of view, we have to create an environment where they are allowed to explore and, if you will, to fail safely so that they actually become engaged and they see success and they build mentorships and, you know, relationships and all of that. The more we can do that earlier on. So with Rep4, we have students at the university working with students in the high schools. I mean, it's a wonderful empowerment for them. Um, it also creates that space and that possibility for students who are, we hope will one day find themselves at the university and whatever path they ultimately take. And, and this is a way of kind of, you know, addressing both the, the needs we have just uh, in terms of addressing a period of change when you can't, you can't memorize everything. It's not possible and we wouldn't want you to. Students, we have to teach them how to find the information at the point they need it and how to assess its, its truth. But you could do that as they're going through a process. It means we have to work very differently with our faculty, um, really open up different kinds of learning spaces for them, create different physical spaces that foster this kind of learning 
Um, and, uh, you know, there's just so much more. But ultimately, this, this I think, is going to be critical to addressing the, um, the, the very problem of student success with our underserved students and our diverse students that we started this question with. Sorry, I was on mute. I know that we will um, we'll come back to some of the more specifics of Rep4, uh, like the, the, the inner machinery of how you're hoping to this idea is going to be made manifest. But something you just said, Mary, and I'm just as interested in having the people in the audience offer their own thoughts to this question in the chat, um, the idea of needing to develop new habits of thought. And I just wrote in the chat three that I heard you say explicitly, which is solving problems, working together as teams, <laughs> finding and assessing information. Um, really, I mean, I'm 50 years old. So in my own educational experience, I would say the only one of those that even remotely showed up in my education was finding and assessing information. I certainly was never proactively about solving problems or really even working together as teams. Um, the question uh, to everybody in the chat and to Presidents Mantella and Papazian out loud, what are the other new habits of thought that you think are most vital uh, for institutions of higher education to be explicitly designed in order to help inculcate? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's to sort of, um, and I'm not sure I'm thinking about the best way to say it, but it's the, it's the freedom to unleash their creativity. It's, it's the practice of doing that. Um, it's the opportunity to apply it to the work, you know, it's like we certainly looked, Sam, if we go back to our education, we can think about places we were instructed about what a team is and why it's important, but our actual practice of it um, and really learning the dynamics of it what made a, a tremendous difference. I think there are strong skills that have always been a part of a, of a generous liberal education, you know, um, in terms of critical thinking um, that are, are particularly important. But I think one of the things is it's not only what, but it's how. So it's being able to learn about the, these skills, but to practice them as well and to practice them in different contexts and settings, uh, not just those that we create through the classroom environment. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and I would add to it, um, just to extend it to maybe some other ideas as well, is I think, um, you know, I say this to students here in San Jose all the time. You know, we have students from East San Jose who may have gone to local schools, came to San Jose State, and are working in a local company. That local company is probably global. And, and so the ability, I think, to understand and to, to be able to think in, in more, you know, in terms of more global or worldviews, multicultural worlds, I think that's going to be really important because even if you're within one city like ours, um, there are multiple communities with very different cultures, very different histories, uh, very different paths. They will overlap in certain ways, but they won't in others. There'll be some unique uh, characteristics. So I think that's really important. The other piece is a certain interconnectedness that um, everything is interdependent in some way. And so you can't just pull, this is, this is to get away from, if you will, the siloed thinking that things really are multidisciplinary, they're interdependent. And, and it's really that intersection between the depth and the breadth that ultimately brings about solutions and real creativity. In answer to the question of why you know, San Jose State was hiring an English literature professor, I came up with a kind of pithy answer, which was probably just because I needed one and that was my best, my best shot. But it was that, well, when was the last great age of innovation? It was the Renaissance. When everything came together, science and learning and philosophy and art and you name it, right, to create a very different world, which is frankly the world we were living on until this fourth industrial revolution. And so I do think there's something about this type of connection 
And it has tremendous implications for built space, tremendous implications for our academic programs, um, for the kind of pathways, this traditional lower division, undergraduate, uh, upper division, where capstones and research only happen at the end is, is frankly entirely backwards in my view. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's lots to, to talk about on that, but I think we're in a moment of really grappling with change differently and changing some of these old habits. Um, let me come back to you both with that in a minute, but I want to bring Lee in on that point. Um, before I do, I also just want to uh, invite everybody in the audience um, to be fully present with us in this conversation to make your own thinking and questions public. Actually, one of the things that I like most about Zoom are the ways in which it invites us not to be anonymous with one another, but to be present. So there is my invitation. Uh, Lee, this idea as a designer of seeing, as Mary said, the interconnectedness and interdependence of all things. Um, I can't think, ironically, of many things less interconnected and interdependent than schools, colleges, and universities, and which is its own, <laughs> and we'll come back to that in a minute and hear uh, the presidents talk about some of the ways in which that might happen. But just from a designer's perspective, Lee, how, what do you observe about what is required in order to create more interconnected, interdependent spaces and places in which we can all learn and live? Yeah, listening to, um, to both of you, um, I, um, over the last few weeks, um, I, I've been hanging on to um, a share by one of our colleagues. Um, Sam and I work with uh, a colleague. Her name is um, Bobby McDonald. In fact, Philly, she she was the one that helped us with the uh, with the Insight Research Paper when we were doing the Digital Learning Center, um, which is now called the Blue Dot Lab, uh, inspired by Carl Sagan's um, Pale Blue Dot, the writing Pale Blue Dot. Uh, which is all about like what what it means to be humans and what does it mean to be humans in the context of the planet Earth and in the context of the larger universe. But I, I, I was hanging on to the conversation, the question that you asked me, Sam, to the larger concern um, of Bobby in, in kind of the threshold moment of having to give a dissertation um, at a, um, an Ivy League um, to, um, at, at a PhD level in which she was concerned about the idea of bringing up that sense of, of, uh, of love in, in, in the work of education and, and worrying that it's not gonna be taken seriously, right? But, but that, that sense of interconnectedness and what you both mentioned in, in your own personal experience and in what your mission is and your vision about uh, what you do um, in the face of public good, in the face of equity and social injustice, is, is the essential idea of love being that interconnectedness, right? So I, and, and I'm, I'm also reminded of like our work together, um, President Mantella at, at Grand Valley, in which, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that we will design a building that needs to be shared by the entire university. You know, no deans were gonna own this building. Um, there was no particular set of users group that we were gonna have users meetings with. Um, so the, 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 the kind of the, the things that Sam and I were hearing um, to the essential idea of interconnectedness and belonging was like, how do, we, how do we maintain a sense of humanity in the face of thinking about a building that's gonna be filled with technology? Um, how do we strengthen our relationship? Um, where do I go to find other big thinkers in the university that I can do my work with? Um, and how do I feel a greater sense of belonging? Uh, and most importantly, can architecture express 
our values of inclusion and equity? I think, I think those are just remarkable questions um, that's on its own without like the, the idea of having to be there to potentially create the architecture that serves it. Um, but to hear that um, to me is, is like the most important thing, right? It, it's the conversation that we wanted to be in um, rather than how much, how many classroom you're gonna need, how many, how many students gonna be in each one of those classrooms. I mean, those are the easy solutions, uh, but to create the conditions for some of those questions to emerge, um, I think that, I think that that's, that's what we need to do to continue the conversation about this interconnectedness and the sense of belonging um, that we all feel that is so essential to us as, as human beings and, and essential to actually how we learn. I want to, um, I, I love that. It's an interesting question. And I want to um, let our two guests respond to it. But first, I also just want to be explicit, right? That even though I know that a lot of the frame of SCUP generally, when we think about design is, um, is this type of design, right? It's spatial design. But I want us to be thinking about design spatially, culturally, structurally, and pedagogically. Um, and so my invitation to Mary and Philly is to respond to Lee's very provocative question from all of those perspectives. So, and I love it because I have no idea what the answer is and maybe you don't yet either, but like what does, what would love made manifest need to look like and require on our future colleges and campuses? And I just wonder what that makes either of you think about. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try, Sam. And thank you, Lee, for that. I mean, that's um, really important stuff. I'll take it from the perspective of a campus that is sitting in the dead center of the 10th largest city in America. We are absolutely an urban campus in the heart of downtown. And we're in a downtown that is going through and we'll see extraordinary transformation over the next decade. Trying as, the, as if you will, the capital they like to call themselves of Silicon Valley, how do we get away from these sprawling, very traditional campuses um, that, that we see all across the valley? Well, Google is coming into downtown on the west side, um, sort of around the transit village, and it is developing this extraordinary project that just got approval yesterday, I believe, at the council. I didn't hear it didn't, so I hope it did. But here's the thing. It started out as a tech company, Behemoth, right? But instead of throwing their weight around as a big tech company with lots of money ready to create 25,000 jobs, they actually worked with the community. There was a, little, a lot of community outrage at first. You're going to take our neighborhoods. You're going to displace us. You know, cost of living is already through the roof. And what they ended up doing in the course of several years of partnering with the city and with the neighborhoods is create a very different project. And it's one that does all of those things. It is spatial, right? It creates the space they need or they believe they need for their work. It is cultural because it builds in it green spaces, housing, a, a quarter of which are affordable housing, spaces and very different design that opens up. You will never see, you have never seen a tech campus like this because it actually opens up into the city and engages and connects with it. We are on the Western side of the city. I mean, on the Eastern side, they're on the Western. So what we anticipate is any design we will have will also connect into the city and will create this interconnectedness between our big campuses, which are now also a part of the city. So that's kind of the bigger picture. Then you move into the actual spaces themselves. Of course, there's practical issues. We've got old buildings, lots of them, and there's only so much we can do to change it. But as we think about new uh, spaces, we're changing, um, for example, the way we bring teaching and research together. We bring those labs on the same floor so that you can be a first year undergrad or even a 
a high school student working in rep four coming and working with students potentially on campus around a problem and you're also seeing our advanced um, our graduate students and researchers on the same floor with collaborative space built in and lots of flexibility in that collaborative space so i think flexibility is going to be the key um, there will be very specific technical space that you need for certain things, but around that and how it's positioned, I think we need to build the connections and the flexibility and move away from ownership. Um, and now this is organizationally or governance wise, who governs these spaces? Are they given to departments where the silos run deep? Um, or do we pull it out from there and say, no, we're going to use it for multiple areas because we want a different kind of intersection and flow. That is a huge cultural transformation. I'll say this, our, our newer faculty um, you know, are really far more um, open to this because they've really come through in a different era. Um, we have four generations of faculty on our campus. And so there's a difference here. But I think building by building, space by space, design by design, lots of open pathways, lots of connections, lots of flexibility within spaces, as few singly owned spaces as one can do while still serving the needs of specific kinds of, of, of labs, for example. Um, and then this sort of reach out for us as an urban center into the community because we do see ourselves as the community's university. So, you know, Lee, you don't ask the easy questions. You ask the tough questions, right? Uh, but, you know, not being an expert in the way we think about sort of designing spaces for the for spatial, stru cultural, structural, and pedagogical approach. I'll just tell you some observations of why I think we ended up with a really special design and we ended up with colleagues that are broadening their work within our university. I mean, first is that it's a kind of a basic principle that, that I operate with, which is our instinct in complex systems is to order the work. That's our instincts, right? It's where our brain goes. We've got so many things, we gotta order this work. Who's gonna own this building? How are we gonna do it? instead of really unleashing the energy, you know, and really listening to people. And I guess, it, you know, when I think about it and I think about love, I think about, you know, it's really about unleashing, you know, pe the best of people. And so it's, there's a basic concept there of listening and really allowing people to share and really trying to take those nuggets and kernels and make meaning out of it. You know, I think there's a basic concept of trust too, you know, it's hard. I mean, I remember as, as you presented that, I'm thinking to myself, you know, how are we gonna assure this gets usage if the deans haven't bought it as they're building? You know, how are we gonna assure X and Y? Um, so, but there's a, the, there's a matter of trust that if the process uh, engenders, you know, a, the, the, the conceptual, spatial, structural and pedagogical, then it is going to get usage because people have so much, there's so much more dimensionality to that concept. And so um, I think the other piece is sort of the lived experience, you know, how, how, and that is a construct that we're using in Rep4, bring in people as they're living and experiencing the, the um, opportunities and the burdens and the barriers to education and um, have them inform the work. And so I also see that, that um, the opportunity to sort of bring that in to the process, um, either in the work as we know it or is in the work as we want it was very much a part of, um, of kind of how the, we thought about that building. So I, I think about that as a case study on your question and what were the processes, the relationship building, the trust building, the unleashing power that got people to sort of rally around the construct to make those dimensions come to life? And I can't wait to go visit and see this amazing space because I'll, I'll learn some things. I wanna add one last layer to this and maybe it comes out of my background. When I wasn't thinking of Renaissance literature, I was a little bit intrigued by art history and sort of the aesthetic space. And, and I actually am a strong believer 
that 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 buildings are more than just places where we house things. They are lived spaces and they need to be aesthetic in some way. Now, I am not a fan, for example, of brutalist architecture. I had a building like that at my previous institution and I never understood it. No, some of you may, may like it, it had its moment um, and it was never mine. But I do think the, um, you know, really being aware of that aesthetic piece, that artistic space, we, whether we're conscious of it or not, we're drawn to that. And that too should reflect a kind of multicultural set of values and experiences that that harmonize in some way, you know, with um, the goals we're trying to create there. And so I actually sent back a design of a building, not for what was inside, which I actually thought was really well done, um, but because of the look. I said, this is not, this looks too traditional and we're trying to create innovation. We can't have that. So this is what I'm looking for. They came back with an amazingly beautiful design. Um, so I do think there's something to be said about the experience of a building, which is it's all senses. Lee, is there anything that you want to add to that yeah. and um, yeah. your own question? Yeah. Well, it reminds me of the Salk Institute, right? I, I keep remembering the story of uh, um, John Salk coming to um, uh, Solomon and said that, you know, I want you to design me this place of science in which Picasso feels comfortable coming here to paint. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking about um, Hugo describing Gothic architecture as, as frozen book because it is at, at that point, you know, architecture was a means to tell stories. Um, I'm not sure what happens in the brutalist era. Um, I'm not sure what was the, pro what was the thought process there. <laughs> Debbie, I mean, you 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 live in Boston, so you looked at City Hall every day, um, and and I still remember back in was it the um, early '90s? There was this incredible partnership between Yo Yo Ma and a, a brilliant landscape architect that was going to put together a musical garden um, that was going to transform the experience in front of the City Hall in Boston. And for some reason, it never got enough momentum to, to, to get finding to get funding for it but um, certainly architecture does have a sense to create that sense of place um, and and I you know uh, language matters so I I, I, I I love the word place more than space because I, I feel that space just contain objects and places contains relationship right or or at least nourish relationships um, so these are really subtle language that um, that I think we need to change. We need to really change that narrative that we're going to think about the next the next version of of uh, higher ed campus. Um, I, I I also feel that you know I, I think that we we live we live in um, an era where um, we have to stop like asking permission and do research on what is the future of. Um, but really design is about um, just bringing on that sense of confidence that we can participate in creating that next future rather than just doing the research and then reacting to it. So, um, so I mean, and it's, it's, it's to a larger conversation, but I, I feel that, um, you know, if we're, if we're going to um, even think about the idea of transformations uh, and creating a more ecosystem that's inter interdependent, interconnected. Um, we we have to like really think differently. We have to put on a new uh, sets of um, you know kind of a superhero cape um, and 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 not just thinking about the single superheroes, um, which which is I I think that it's it's a it's a luxury that architects no longer can have. Like we have to get rid of the Howard Gardner, uh, the Howard, the Howard work mentality of the laundry genius. But we have to think of like we require a Renaissance team um, that has kind of this um, complex, multi-level disciplines and expertise because we're we're really needing to being asked to solve very complex problems than before. So I have one. Uh, final question from me for our two guests, and then I want to turn to those of you that are here and see what questions you have about what you've heard, about Rep 4, about Love Made Manifest, about all of these challenges that we're talking about. But the, the last question that I have, um, 
So actually earlier today, for, for anybody that was here late, we began by talking about like what number Zoom call this was for us. Debbie wouldn't even share hers. Uh, Mary's on the West Coast and this is already number five. Uh, Philomena started to have pal heart palpitations as soon as I asked the question. But anyway, in an earlier Zoom call for me, I was a part of a meetup. It was a global meetup of educators who are doing nature-based work. And so there were people on the call from Barcelona and Paris and Canada and the US, all different ages. And this one woman who was there was talking about the work that she was doing with very young children. And, and the learning she shared was she said, I realized that topics were actually a way of short circuiting the learning. Because if we began this thing with a topic, the reality was the kids just wanted to go deeper. And she said, what I realized is actually, we need to design not with topics, but gerunds. So like, what is the gerund we seek? Is it gardening? Is it learning? Is it solving? Is it exploring? Is it wondering? And the question I have for you, which admittedly is an impossible question as presidents of existing institutions that are so grounded in rightly in expertise and departments and the idea of imagining a future of learning in which the way we build those new habits of thought is more explicitly through gerunds than topics. I'm just curious what that makes the two of you think about. I mean, I'm, I love it because a gerund is, um, is something that continues. It's a process. It has motion and momentum. A topic is fixed in a, in a particular point in time. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to capitalize and, and characterize what I think really has to happen, which is it's not about what we know. It's about how we learn. And how we learn is, is what is going to help us through and, and addressing the challenges uh, and the opportunities, frankly, of our world. Um, it is too fast. We cannot master skills anymore. We don't have the, the sage on the stage model anymore. And that all has to go. That doesn't mean we don't have experience and wisdom and an ability to shape questions and to guide and all of those things. And so I think of this is, you know, part of it, this classic model of the lifelong learner. This is actually really important. The learner starts young, but the learner stays young throughout the many decades that one is around to learn. And those stay young who stay young, if you will, are those who are learning throughout their lives. We will all be learning throughout their lives. And you notice that's not a fixed topic. It's, it's, is it a noun or is it a gerund? You can decide, but it's, it's about a constant process of change. And the truth is we have to open up the space for people not to fear constant change. Um, it is our desire, as, as Philly said earlier, to create order out of chaos, to bring our arms around it. And this is where I think our humanists can help us because humanists actually live in ambiguity, live in a period of change, live without a fixed answer. In my first semester, I, used to, I taught engineers Milton poetry. And you can imagine these engineers who wanted, they were building cars and they want, this is Detroit after all, and they wanted that answer. And it took me really all semester to help them understand that there are many ways around it. And those perspectives are itself what is important here. And I think it's this notion of a lifelong learner, that the learning can happen from any direction, from anywhere. Um, if we don't embrace that as institutions and create, we may be fixed in one sense, but the only place we should be fixed is in the actual physical space that we own. Beyond that, we should be very flexible our reach is much broader. Our students, our alums who come back, who engage in learning, who we go out to reach. Um, this is a constant iteration and synergy um, that frankly is, um, you know, is the only, only way we can capture this moment. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that Mary said it so well. And I think that 
um, as you think about the future and what, what we're working on in education, it's really um, how do we create the, the frameworks and the opportunities for people to be rewarded for that kind of thinking, to be encouraged for that kind of thinking. If we, if we um, you know, think about some of our classic phrases, it's okay to be undecided for your first couple of semesters and then pick your major, your major, your minor, these concepts that create structures and um, rigidity about the way that that learners think about their continuous learner. We don't, continuous learning process, we don't have vehicles that follow you like a transcript that are saying, this is a constant reflective process of bringing in who you are, how you've developed, what you know, what you practice to create what you think is possible or to apply what, what, what you are taking to various kinds of settings and different kinds of work and, and seeing the breadth of your your learning if you thought talking about a philosopher and their approach to thinking you can think about the breadth of work in the conversation we're having right now around this table um, and so i think changing the language from some of the classic ways we term progress is a really important part it's not only what we're trying to achieve but how we reflect on the progress we're making Lee, anything you'd like to add? Not from my end. I, I want to listen more <laughs> what they have to say. So um, first of all, um, Mary Papazzi and Philomena Mantella, thank you so much for making the time to be with us all here today, because I think everybody has a pretty good intuitive understanding of just how many things are currently um, building up that require your attention. Um, because of that, we want to make sure that those of you that have also made time to come here today can ask your questions directly. So, esteemed audience members, what questions do you have based on what you've heard or what you have most been wondering about that led you here today? Oh, I've actually turned off my turned off my or on my mic, um, and and I want to say this has been really fascinating for me, and and um, very pleased that that you could share this. A very, for me, an energizing and inspiring conversation. Uh, I I feel grateful uh, that I had an architectural education because, in fact, we did solve problems. We did work together um, in finding and assessing information, and so. It's been a really, I think, flexible platform for thinking and for leading clients. I mean, I listened to Lee and, and there's a reason why I totally enjoyed working with him. He just has, has a way of, of sharing his thoughts that, that is uh, constantly inspiring. Um, and I think it's, it's good to think about this lifelong learner thing. I think a lot of people think of it's old people living next to campus and taking classes. Uh, but for me, it really is, no matter what we did yesterday, it is totally less relevant than what we can do tomorrow. And instead of saying, oh yeah, I've done 39 of these kind of buildings, <laughs> that's great, but that was yesterday. And as you both said, the, the speed of change is so quick. And I've been in architecture long enough that when I first started practicing as a junior person, I, you know, after a while, kind of got comfortable with, I knew what I was doing. Then I realized that I can't think like a college student anymore. I, I, I no longer <laughs> am in that kind of generation where I can relate to exactly what they're doing and then technology comes in. There is a whole new world going on and, and the pace of change is so quick. The, the sobering thing about practicing architecture these days is as time goes on, I feel less confident and less capable than I did before. And it's because I'm presented with new challenges. And what, in addition to being an architect, I, I want and feel like I need to be uh, a sociologist, a psychologist, a cultural anthropologist, a neuroscientist, because there's so much that I don't know. And instead of sort of feeling comfortable with what I do know, what I don't know is who are these students coming at us? You talk about equity. Who are these first generation? 
And instead of knowing what to offer them, we need to ask them, what can we do to retain you? And so as, as a practitioner in architecture, um, it is sobering the longer I practice, the less I feel <laughs> I'm in control of what I'm doing because it is changing. And so your conversations um, are, are really interesting because they're inspiring to think about things in a different way. Um, and, and so how, what advice would you two give to architects to help us serve you better as we try our best to design places, not spaces, uh, for you to inhabit on campuses? So I'll, I'll jump in and give it a shot. And thank you for the, the information on the Brutalists. I really do appreciate that. And um, we'll, we'll reflect on it actually and, uh, and think about where we were at that time. I would say this, it's like everything else, we need interdisciplinary teams. And so, you know, architects uh, working without others around them to inform them won't see those full perspectives. None of us knows the answers, but we all, depending on whatever space we inhabit, we know what we know, but we need those other perspectives at the table. And I, I see that in a lot of different professions now. And you certainly see that in, in the tech space. You actually um, have uh, people, not just engineers, but you've got, you know, we need, we need sociologists at the table thinking about the impact of something. We need um, uh, humanists thinking about how it, it, psychologists, you name it. And so I think having that key team around that provides those perspectives, um, you know, can inform the work that, that you or anyone does, whether it's an architect or an engineer or, or anyone in, in any other profession. I think that's a great point. I just would add to that, um, you know, Mary commented on the, uh, the way in which um, the Rep4 initiative brought together people with a level of humility and, um, and made us all curious about what we could learn from each other and how we could move things forward. And I think, you know, uh, in terms of examining the self-examination that Mary is really talking about, uh, um, finding those compatible um, and intersectional players um, to strengthen your questions, to strengthen your process. Um, I'm not sure what you do when you go to talk with someone and they are, have such certitude about what they want to do with the, you know, the building and with the, the, whatever it is you're being engaged to do, you know, how you create that space to have them think about it perhaps a little differently. I mean, I think we all need, you know, I want to follow Mary's practice, right? So if you're coming to talk with me and you're bringing insights around the way you think about these intersections of spatial and cultural and pedagogical, I love those four frames. You know, I wanna to listen to that. So I think there's a, I would imagine that part of the challenge is the, the you know, do you do what the client wants or do you try to really extract what it is they, they, that helps them fulfill their mission as well. And, um, you know, one of the things one of our faculty members said when, when I came in and we, we did what we called huddles rather than a listening tour, it was like, we're going to come together and think together and try to create an environment, even through the language that we were appreciating what people were bringing to the table. And, you know, one of the faculty member coined sort of the reciprocity of learning and really kind of put himself out there and said, you know, of course you hear, I've learned as much from my students as, as um, you know, as I'm able to teach them, but did it with such uh, humility and new language, I think, around that helps people think about, well, that is, that is what we're creating. We're creating this constant learning cycle where we're all getting stronger. Because as you, as you said, Debbie, you know, we're all further from the preparation phase you know, and into the practice and we're further from this generation. So how do you create that reciprocity and, and energy um, so that people really want to engage and help you learn um, and still present yourself as the expert? Being expert and learner is a hard mix, particularly if you're trying to secure, you know, uh, a particular business engagement. But I think it, I think it's an important one. And I think we see people wanting it more because 
you got to be insane to think you know everything. I mean, really, I just, I can't even imagine, um, you know, coming at my job with certitude. It's so 20th century. It's so 20th century. It's yeah. not hip. Um, Drake, you had an interesting question. I wonder if you'd like to ask some variation of it directly. The conversation has uh, suggested something that in my experience was quite, quite unique. And that was when I was uh, a studio master uh, at the University of Colorado many years ago, I had a student in the grad class who had a Montessori background. And many things that Philomena said um, echo my experience with this young lady. Um, her level of curiosity was absolutely inspiring. Um, I guess in some context, you might say that she was completely unhinged, that she had no sense of direction. But as I worked with her and just, all I could do was really just make suggestions, ask questions. Um, the end result of her studio project for her masters was um, a fabulous um, marine um, museum and um, marine veterinary facility. Um, and she did go on to specialize in that. And, and, and she often would make references to her Montessori education, which was not so much about the topics uh, as what is this thing we're looking at? Uh, how would you characterize it? What does it mean? Um, what can we learn from it? And then at the end of that process, maybe you give it a name. And so it wasn't, so as you said, Mary, she flipped it on its head. And instead of starting with the, the, the pinnacle of it all, which is the topic, she was down here mucking around, looking at different aspects of this concept that she had. And at the end of the day, we sat back and just marveled at this end result. It was almost like it made itself happen. Um, and she was more the facilitator of it. And so I, I can't tell you how honored I was to, I mean, of all the students that I had in that, in that school, um, she certainly stands out. And it's, um, I think if she were at certain other, certain other schools, she would have really struggled because not because of her, but because of the faculty and the system, which would have basically strangled her. So I think that some of the things you're talking about, both of you, um, are really quite intriguing. And um, well, and if I if I may, Drake, that last bit, I, I think that's a really interesting thing to think about from the perspective of university presidents. So you have such a large, if the university itself is an ecosystem and is a living system, then there are very different components at very different stages of readiness and comfort with the discomfort of change and willingness to change versus intractable reluctance to change. As a leader, how do you how do you navigate those inevitable differences in the larger community that you're charged with serving? So, I mean, I, I, I love Drake's question and description. And um, I think there's some sort of basics in that story of Montessori versus the future of education, Montessori education that, ha that I, you know, I kind of, boil down to some principles, you know, one is kind of starting where the individuals are at, right? That's just kind of a principle. And Drake's young woman, you know, she had a particular learning style. He was patient, which seemed like chaos, but 
was brilliance in a different form, you know? And so I, that's kind of what I think about is starting where people are at. So at our university, you know, people are really comfortable with the role of the faculty being beyond the classroom. They, they take great pride in, in defining the role as one of care and reciprocity and concern and guidance. They don't say, well, that's not, the, that's a career person's job or that's the advisor's job. It's, you know, it's, so starting where people are at, what became a sim simple principle for me was they're inspired by the student's voice. So one of the characteristics, you know, of that my change agenda is to position the learner as the voice for change because I'm the administrator, you know. I mean, there's a certain amount of thinking that, you know, is this person going to come and go? Is this going to be agenda that stays? Is this going to be able to challenge? Is this challenging the way I do my work? Do I have the skills or competencies to move in the work? But if the if the student if they can see, touch, and feel here at this institution, what the student is going to receive, that is what becomes the motivator. So that becomes like how to, what, what's the culture and how do you create a change agenda around that culture, um, you know, is kind of where I begin. Yeah, Jake, that's a, a great question. I, I would only add this that, um, uh, first of all, uh, I want to, just give our faculty some some credit here. They pivoted in a weekend to an online environment in a way that nobody ever thought they could. Now, some people, all they did was just pretend they were in class and did a Zoom, you know, lecture. But many others, actually, over the course of the summer, uh, certainly on our campus, and I know on many others, took the check, took the opportunity to actually rethink their pedagogy. And to really, you know, they, they do put the students um, at the center and they did think about ways they could have an impact. I think it, it surprised them. Some will revert back to where they were. This was temporary, but others will continue to engage. But I think it's this, uh, look, you know, human nature is such that none of us likes change or if we like change, we like it when it's everybody else but us. We never like it when it's us, right? We all believe in change as long as everybody else is changing. This is just human nature. And I think we should just recognize that nobody is wrong because they're resistant to change. They're resistant because they believe somehow that what they're doing makes sense, right? Has validity. And we haven't really created the communication space to bring them to a different place. Now, there will always be those who never you know, go there. But it's actually, in my experience, a relatively small percentage. The other characteristic we didn't put out there was communication. And this is where stories matter. Being able to really frame what we're doing, as, as Philly just said, frame it around the learner or frame it around a different mission or frame it around a set of values or whatever it is, because we know that, that culture eats strategy for lunch every day, right? Another phrase we all know. So we've got to somehow create the space which is non-judgmental, right? As soon as you make it judgmental, then people will dig in. Again, it's just simple human nature. It's nothing inherently bad about them. We all do it too. We just don't always see it in ourselves. And so I find that, um, you know, I lay it out. I do a lot of, you know, repeating of it in ways from different perspectives, small groups, large groups, individual, whatever it might be. And then you've got to really listen and hear what people say. It is... Uh, it takes a lot of patience. I know Philly mentioned this, it really does. Um, because, and some things though, I will say this, I've had moments where the change happened faster than I could have imagined because I didn't expect it, but people were more ready than I thought. And so when you see it pushing back, I pull back. Unless it's a health and safety issue uh, or the funding's gonna disappear tomorrow, right? There's, or there's a legal issue. I can probably be more patient than I am at this moment, right? And so knowing when to pull back, take your foot off the gas a little bit, you know, let them get used to the idea, then come back. It's a, it, this is where it's an art and a science. And this is where you have to not only push, but also hold back. And, and it, it actually happens over time when you, when, you, when you look back and you say, we really are a different place than we were. Five, I've been at San Jose State five years. We're really a different place than we were five years ago. 
Um, but um, some people think it's too fast. Other people are all, all you know, 100% all in and wish we can go faster. Um, but so far, no revolution. And as long as I don't have a revolution, I feel pretty safe and pretty good. I think we have time for one final question. And then I'm going to bring this to a close. What, what final question would somebody like to ask? I have an anecdote if somebody's not going to jump in. Uh, Debbie, let's end with your anecdote. OK, so um, I think following up with something that, that uh, President Kakazian was saying, this, this business of, um, of being student-centered in, in the approach. I mean, we've learned over the last 10 years now, at least, that we don't talk about teaching on campus. We talk about learning. So focus on learning spaces as opposed to teaching spaces. And it reminds me of something that is such a, an influence and an inspiration and a reminder. It's really a reminder over time. Uh, a story about uh, two fathers or, or two parents take their children into the woods and one come, goes into the woods and says, this person is just, this, this parent is just so knowledgeable and, and points out all the names of the birds and all the names of the trees and just tells the child everything that they know uh, about you know, being in the woods. And you know, feeling really good about all this knowledge that he, that, that he is imparting on the child. And the other parent goes and takes the child into the woods and then says, stop, stop here. What do you hear? What do you see? How do you feel? And, and you know, you're thinking that the first parent just thinks that, that they have it nailed, but the second person is inviting the child to participate, to engage, not feeling intimidated by having to remember all the information, just be present. And, and so when I think about higher ed and I hear what you're saying, I was reminded of that because uh, a lot of times we do forget. It's, it's not necessarily imparting knowledge, it's drawing knowledge out. And so I, this, this has been so inspiring. I would love to sit and, and chat for longer, but um, I, I think the idea of, of being, starting where the individual is, is such a strong reminder and tenet for what it is we're trying to do. Yeah, I feel like if, if nothing else, if all of us from our various perspectives get a little bit better at starting where people are at, being more patient, fostering more intentional cultures of caring, following the learners, and when folks push back, pulling back, uh, and then I guess also being more curious than certain, then I think we have a better chance of creating the kind of future that we want. Um, President Papazi and President Mantella, thank you both so much for your time and your wisdom and the ways in which you're modeling for the rest of us what the future of higher education can look like. I did share earlier a link to rep for, but I'm just trying to remember, is there a specific website that you'd like us to leave people with where they can go to learn more? Just rep4.org. Rep4.org is where you can learn more. It's a project that's just getting started. And if it's able to achieve its lofty aspirations, it's really going to shift the way all of us think about education and equity. Um, thanks to everybody for coming. Hope you have a lovely rest of your day. And um, we'll see you all down the road. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for facilitating. Thanks. 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 Thank you all. Thank you.